Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jack Douglas. Tonight's armchair vacation will move so fast, covers so much ground, offers so many things to see and do, that there isn't time for a lengthy prologue. During the next 30 minutes, we will spend 10 days in Tennessee. This reconstructed fort on the banks of the Cumberland River in Nashville is a replica of old Fort Nashboro, named in honor of Francis Nash, a Revolutionary War hero. The Stockade Settlement was founded in 1779 by James Robertson and John Donaldson. Later, Fort Nashboro became known as Nashville. The original fort enclosed two acres and protected the settlers against Indian attack. This 1930 reproduction is somewhat smaller than the original, but is only a few blocks away from the site of the old fort. In Nashville, the state capital, by the way, a city of roughly 200,000 population, a most unique and unexpected tourist attraction is the Parthenon, an almost identical copy of the temple to the goddess Athena on the Acropolis in Athens. Of Nashville's fine old homes and mansions, Belle Mead is probably the best known and one of the best preserved and a showplace of the South. Belle Mead is the mansion that was once a 5,000 acre plantation and thoroughbred nursery and stud farm. Iroquois, a Belle Mead thoroughbred of the late 19th century, was until 1954 the only American bred winner of the English Derby. During the war between the states, Belmead served as temporary headquarters for Confederate troops, and these bullet and shell nicks on the portico columns attest to the fighting on the front lawn during the Battle of Nashville. The state capitol building at Nashville is impressive even from a distance, and on the grounds of the capitol is the final resting place of President James Polk, the North Carolinian who adopted Tennessee as his home state. Also at the Capitol is this tribute to President Andrew Jackson. Now, like Polk, Jackson was born in the Carolinas, but started his political career in Tennessee. And of course, Jackson's hermitage near Nashville is one of the half dozen best known homes in all America. It reposes in the shadows of tall trees, and from 1819 on, it was the home and the pride of America's seventh president and his beloved wife, Rachel. The original hermitage consisted of a group of log cabins, and here the Jacksons lived from 1804 to 1819, when the new main house was built. The hermitage is a registered national landmark and is managed by the Ladies' Hermitage Association. Much that is in the dining room is original. Table, candelabra with so-called wind glasses, Decatur silver vegetable serving dishes, and bohemian wine decanters. The president's office or library was for 30 years the political center of the United States, really and truly. This chair was gifted to the general by Chief Justice Taney of the famed Dred Scott decision. And old Hickory's spectacles remain where he always left them on a small mahogany candle stand. The master bedroom has been preserved as it was on the day the president passed away in 1845 at the age of 78. Notice the steps. The bed was really a high four-poster. On the opposite wall are portraits of Jackson's granddaughter, Rachel, the pet and companion of his declining years. Also, a portrait of Mrs. Jackson, and at the foot of the bed, the familiar battered stovepipe hat. The general selected his own tomb site at the east end of the hermitage in 1831. Three years earlier, he had buried his wife in this garden, and the family plot also includes the grave of Uncle Alfred, the general's faithful servant who lived to the golden age of 98 years. Leaving the hermitage on Rachel's Lane, your last impression of the hermitage is one of serenity and beauty. 
The ancestral home of President Polk is in Columbia, Tennessee, and we're told that this is an excellent likeness of America's 11th president. His wife, Sarah, is remembered as one of the nation's best-loved first ladies. And of her, a contemporary wrote, she is very handsome, her eyes are black and beautiful. She reminds one of a Spanish doña. This antique music box is of Swiss manufacture, and especially in those days, it was a highly prized import. This now is Greenville in East Tennessee, and except in the obvious ways, this pleasant little community of 12,000 people hasn't changed much since 1826, when a young man of 17, a tailor by trade, came here from North Carolina. Well, today, his tailor shop is encased within an outer structure, and inside the dingy shop, the simple tools of his trade have been preserved for posterity. For the tailor who owned this shop was destined to become President of the United States, Andrew Johnson. Before his death, he was reviled by many and almost impeached from office, as we know. Yet beneath this monument in Greenville are the mortal remains of a southerner and slaveholder who in 1860, during the term of Lincoln, stood before the Senate and proclaimed his faith in the Union. A very special man, a very courageous man, is remembered here. By the banks of this delicate stream, there was born yet another tremendous Tennessean, the name Davy Crockett. Born and raised in humble surroundings, he became a living American idol and died a hero's death at the Alamo. The man who was to avenge the Alamo taught school in Tennessee. Yes, this is the Sam Houston Schoolhouse in Blount County. Houston was then barely 19 years of age and had very little formal schooling, but he was an avid reader and could recite much of Homer from memory. His tuition rate, by the way, was $2 cash, a few bushels of corn, and some calico cloth. Except for the modern homes in the distance, this is what the Tennessee Valley near Maryville looked like in the days when the Cherokee Indians paddled their canoes on the Little Tennessee River. They would stop here and walk this time-worn path up the hill to Fort Loudoun, built by the British in 1757 as the southwestern outpost of colonial America. Only a few years later, during the French and Indian Wars, the once friendly Cherokees turned hostile. After a five-month siege, the starving garrison surrendered. Thirty of the settlers were massacred, and the rest made prisoners of the Cherokees. Yes, the youngsters will find much to capture their imagination at Fort Loudoun, and so will you. Shelbyville is noted as the pencil city of the world, and the nearby town of Wartrace is the cradle of the Tennessee walking horse. Now, what on earth is the Tennessee walking horse? All right. The development of this breed started during the war between the states when the finest cavalry horses of the south were bred with the best horses of the north, especially the Vermont Morgan horse. Well, the result of this long and careful breeding is a magnificent animal that is strong, intelligent, and has a pleasant disposition. More important, the horse has three distinctive and comfortable gaits, the flat foot, the canter or rocking chair gait, and the running walk. And these gaits exhaust neither the horse nor the rider. We photograph the three gaits in slow motion as well as regular speed. entrance to the Lookout Mountain battlefield overlooking the city of Chattanooga. And numerous cannon and plaques attest to the battle above the clouds that took place here when General...
Grant ordered General Hooker to attack the Confederate forces on the mountain under General Bragg. Lookout Mountain today is a very scenic spot, and despite the mountain haze, you see Chattanooga in the distance. Memphis is a magical place, and someday we'd like to return here and spend an entire vacation in this one city, Memphis on the Mississippi. And that's cotton, you all, and in Memphis, cotton is king. In fact, bales of cotton, they're called snakes, by the way, are everywhere on Front Street, the downtown street that is the Cotton Row of Memphis. Beale Street is another way of saying W.C. Handy. And at Handy Park, the city has honored the trumpeter composer who achieved national prominence in Memphis at the turn of this century. Memphis gave Handy the opportunity and the father of the blues gave the world a new kind of music. The Beale Street Blues, the Memphis Blues, the St. Louis Blues, songs that were to be translated and sung in every language known to man. This is a restaurant, although its name is nowhere in sight. And this exclusive restaurant doesn't even advertise, it doesn't have to, for this is Justine's not only one of the oldest and finest restaurants in the South, but in all America. The food is rich, it is superb, it is elegantly served. Justine's, a highlight at twilight in Memphis. And while you're in Memphis, drive just a few miles from downtown to this museum operated by Memphis State University. Once through the entrance, you may be greeted as I was by Grady John, one of the numerous Choctaw Indian guides. Jack Douglas, all the Choctaws, we want to welcome you at the Chukalisa Indian Village. This is a real prehistoric Indian village. And this is where Indian lived about a thousand years ago. The museum site is Chukalisa Indian Town, a thousand years old and slowly but faithfully being excavated and restored by the university. Founded around 900 AD, the settlement prospered until the early 1600s when its inhabitants simply up and left. Hence the Indian name Chukalisa, meaning deserted house or town. New discoveries are being made almost daily and from these many findings, the archeologists have slowly pieced together a fantastic true story of temples and high priests and purification rites not in Aztec, Mexico, but in Tennessee, America. But this is a torture frame. That's where they torture people. They probably kill their own people, but they have to punish. They throw a spear at him, they whipped him, and that's the place where they punish. This now is the entrance to the burial grounds, but if you take the youngsters, forewarn them of what they will see. This is a burial exhibit. Some of these skeletons are very old. It's carbon dated with radioactive, about a thousand years. These people buried right behind a house, buried about 16 in a shallow grave. They got up to 35 to 39 years old. They was old people. These original wall paintings, this is the sun, reveal the high cultural skill of the ancient Indian. This is a spider, and this ornate figure is that of a high priest. Chukalisa, a place you'll talk about for years to come after you spend 10 days in Tennessee. This was the home in Jackson, Tennessee of Casey Jones, the brave engineer who died at the throttle of engine 382, better known as Cannonball. Now, if all these years you thought that John Luther, Casey Jones, was merely a legend, well, join a club, I guess most of us have thought so. His home in Jackson has been preserved as a museum by the city. The famous collision occurred in April of 1900, and not a single passenger was seriously injured. Only Casey lost his life, staying at the throttle, trying desperately to slow down engine 382. And Casey dearly loved this old gramophone with its scratchy recording of Yankee Doodle Dandy, and paraphrased lyrics. He 
ordered his firemen to jump, but he stayed with a cannonball to the end of the glory road. So if you're in or near Jackson, do visit the Casey Jones Home and Museum. Now we come to the Tennessee we've heard and read so much about, the Tennessee of great scenic splendor. And these are scenes in the Cherokee National Forest. Drive east just a few miles, perhaps 10 or 15, and you'll enter one of America's great national parks, the Great Smoky Mountains. And here at the foothills, the air is so clear, you wonder why these are called the Smoky Mountains. But look up at the high peaks, and the smoky haze is quite noticeable. Gatlinburg is the main north entrance to the half million acre park. And with some five million people visiting Great Smoky Mountains National Park each year, Gatlinburg has become a year-round vacation mecca. The skiing in season is very good, but in the off-season, the ski lift is most unusual. Now you'll see why in just a moment. And now watch as the lifts cross over the main streets, and believe me, they startle the daylights out of the unsuspecting motorists. But Gatlinburg has more to offer than the average resort town or city. It is the handicraft center of Tennessee and quite possibly of the nation. For example, the Candelier shop is devoted to handmade candles, but what candles, as you'll shortly see. Here, the young lady dips the roughed out forms into coloring vats and now samples of finished work in the gift shop. And incidentally, we found the prices fantastically reasonable, and our camera crew came home loaded down with enough candles to light up the Mardi Gras. Well, perhaps we were influenced by this quotation, there is not enough darkness in all the world to put out the light of one small candle. The Pigeon Forge Pottery Shop, six miles from Gatlinburg, utilized local clays and glazes from Smoky Mountain Minerals to create not merely simple vases such as this one in progress, but eye-catching work that's hard to resist when you're on a vacation and thinking of gifts for back home. Just take a look. The wood whittlers of Gatlinburg, but say they're not whittling, they're making furniture. Well, true enough, but some of the whittlers whittle, and what a setting he has. Just set there a spell and whittle. Well, I wish I could whittle like this, and incidentally, no paints or stains are used. Those are the natural wood colors with only a lacquer or wax to give a permanent finish. And they'll invite you to pull up a chair and whittle away at the wood whittlers in Gatlinburg. As we leave the city limits, we'll visit one last craft shop, and a unique one it is. The sign says, broom shop, if out, blow horn. How's that again? Well, anyway, the cars, father and son, make a special broom with a rounded handle that looks like an oversized whisk broom. But the size and the handle make it easy to use, and the people in these parts claim it's the best broom in the whole world and Tennesseans are not given to bragging. And even though we speeded up the camera, it takes an awful lot of work to make just one of these car brooms. This now is a section of a small valley in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The valley is known as Cades Cove, C-A-D-E-S, Cades Cove. Now, white settlers first came here in the early 1800s and isolated from the outside world, Cates Cove is to this day without electricity. When the Great Smoky Mountains became a national park, a handful of families, descendants of the original settlers, were allowed to remain at Cates Cove under special permits. Here they were born, here they were baptized, here they spent all the years of their lives, many without stepping foot outside the valley. And you can't blame them why would they want to leave all this?
This is known as the Peter Cable Place. The main cabin and the adjacent smokehouse were built by the third settler in Cades Cove, and that's going back almost a century and a half. Native honey is a primary source of income for at least several of the families in Cades Cove. The price is a dollar per jar, and the honor system is local custom. Well, there's more than honey to attract vacationers to Cades Cove. And you'd be surprised how many amateur painters come to this valley. They just pull up the car, set up an easel, and they're at peace with the world. Mystery Hill on the north edge of Gatlinburg is our last stop. And if you've never seen water running uphill, well, now you have. No, there are no tricks. For this house on Mystery Hill is one of half a dozen spots in America that apparently defy the laws of nature. Our camera is not tilted. The house is. And yet, you must walk like this or fall over. And here's more proof that gravity seems to have gone kerplut at Mystery Hill. it's time to leave this lovely place called Tennessee. I've said this about some of our other America visits. I'll say it again. I wish we had more time to show you the many other colorful people and places and landmarks that we saw and photographed, but simply could not find room for in this half hour. We saw much that is unforgettable in this great volunteer state, but speaking for myself, this is the one scene I'll never forget the mountain mist slowly enveloping a small valley. It's enough to bring anyone back to spend another 10 days in Tennessee. This is Dayton, Tennessee, and the controversy started in this drugstore at this very table. The controversy that led to the Scopes Pollution Trial in 1925. John Scopes, a high school teacher, was placed on trial for teaching the Darwinian theory of evolution in violation of a then recently passed law. The world famous trial was conducted in this old courthouse. The judge's bench, the table and chairs of the prosecution, seat for a handful of spectators, that momentous trial in Dayton. Now until next week, Jack Douglas saying thank you so much and good night Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls.